get my six. Ah. What's up, everybody? Who's in the mood for some creepy camp fire stories? Even though there's not currently a fire in the pit, there will be later uh, this evening. We're going to be camping tonight again, hopefully. What I mean by that is it has nothing to do with the rain. We've been getting rained on, but the tent's waterproof. We love sleeping outside in the rain in the tent. We stay dry, and it's just puts you to sleep, you know? Um, but... I guess I'm literally, like, literally not allowed to tell creepy campside, campfire stories anymore because my wife gets too terrified. <clears throat> Hadn't done it in a while, and I know she used to get scared. I always thought she was joking. Last time I did it, she threatened to get up and go in the house and not come back to the campground uh, for the evening. And so I, I just didn't tell any creepy stories for a while. But last night we were camping up here. We had a wonderful fire going. My son wanted to hear a scary story, so I started telling one, and my wife took off and left me and him and went and spent the night in the house, and she would not come back the whole night. So I guess I learned my lesson. Problem is, as a storyteller, uh, I like telling stories. I enjoy it, and, and you know, I don't make very many videos here on YouTube anymore, and I'm actually going to get to that here in this video as to why that is. I told you guys about four months before I pretty much ceased making videos on here that I was going to, and I told you why and how I was going to do it. Well, it worked. So anyway, um, I'm going to read you three stories here this evening from True Hauntings Volume 3, Personal Stories of Real Experiences with the Paranormal, Supernatural, Cryptids, Aliens, and UFOs. Uh, this is a collection of many, many short stories that I've put together as an editor, um, submitted by some of you. It's available on Amazon or autographed by me uh, from our Etsy store. I'll make sure the links to both of those places are in the description box below. Got a couple of, well, I got three. They're not too long, so bear with me. Um, I have missed this, and I have taken a break, and I'm going to make efforts to do it more going forward and I'm still writing now we're, we're this is on pause this series is on pause for now this is the third volume because there's a project I've been working on for a number of years that I want to finish up this year it's a writing project um, it's another collection of, of short stories it's not for Halloween though I'll tell you that that's all I'm going to tell you it knock on wood big block of wood here um, it will be out by the end of this year and you will know all about it um, I, I saw the movie yesterday. We went to the theater and saw the movie Big George Foreman. And I, first of all, great movie. Second of all, I read his autobiography called King George. The movie follows the storyline from the book almost to a T. And it was wonderful to see that because I, I'm an avid reader and I like to read a, read a book and then watch the movie based on the book. And Hollywood does a really good job of destroying storylines mostly because they want to push some sort of political agenda or some sort of social justice narrative that has nothing to do with the actual story as it was written and they take wonderful pieces of literature and make really crap movies that are popular for a short while because they fit the current pop culture narrative they didn't do that with big george's story and that was wonderful to see because that man <clears throat> is he's still alive such an inspiration um so anyway i was inspired by that movie here's my point to that you know he spent 10 long years out of the ring preaching had to go back into boxing because he was broke preaching wasn't paying them the bills and he ended up regaining the world heavyweight championship title at 45 years old it's something that had never been done hasn't been done since i was inspired by that and so i'm i'm finishing up this writing project i'm working on and i'm going to have it out by the end of the year and i will be number one again it's been 12 long years since i was number one on amazon with a ghost novel or a collection of ghost themed stories it's been 12 years i'm older i put on some weight but i was inspired by big george so i'm adding chopping down trees to my exercise regiment i lost a lot of weight last year um in, with my distance running training, but I put some of it on, put some of it back on. I've been inspired to lose it again from that movie. I, I've got to lose about 12 pounds. Got to get really fit, tweak my diet a little bit, but I believe I can do all these things just like George Foreman did. And I, I believe I can be number one on Amazon again by the end of the, of the year with this 
uh, story collection that I've been working on for a number of years. As long as I get fit, get in good shape, and pound out the words properly, um, and set some of the other smaller projects on the back burner. So go see that movie, okay? It's worth it. Uh, what an inspiration. And I asked my wife this question yesterday because she saw the movie with me. I really have to wonder, are, there, are, are people like George Foreman just special in some certain way that they can, first of all, do what he did as a young man, be the heavyweight boxing champion of the world, and then at middle age just decide to be great again and actually go out there and, and get it done? I mean, he knocked out a 26-year-old Michael Moore to regain the title. Michael Moore was 35-0 and 0 and he'd won 30 of his fights by knockout. The kid was unstoppable. He was the first, Michael Moore was the first Southpaw heavyweight champion, in case you didn't know that. And a 45-year-old man knocked him out cold in the 10th round. So my question is, is that sort of special, just in special people like George Foreman, or is it in all of us? And I asked my wife that, and she said, you know what, honey, I think it's in all of us. Some people just choose to pursue it and some people don't. Some people are content with the status quo. If their basic needs are met and they're comfortable, they don't pursue any sort of greaterness past that. And, and I think I have to agree with my wife. So that's why I think even though I'm, I'm turning 50 this year and I put on the weight, I believe I can be number one writer again on Amazon. So we're going to do it. And with no further ado, as my beautiful bride dearly, a.k.a. Giggly Girl, would say, I'm going to read you these three stories. You're going to enjoy them. Um, and I, I want to thank everybody again who submitted stories for these collections. So the first one is called The Farmer's Father, and it was submitted by David Arellis. says, Mr. Lake, and it's, it's not long, just a couple pages, two and a half pages, if you like paranormal and creepy stuff, you'll enjoy these. I was watching your channel recently. I do so every few months or so just to see what you're up to. You were talking about something you saw during the month of October while, as you said it, the veil was thin. Personally, I do not believe in any of that hocus pocus stuff, and it's why I only watch your channel occasionally. I prefer the videos you make when you talk about your life experiences. There is so much wisdom in those talks, but I understand that most people don't want to hear that and they prefer the hocus pocus stuff and that you have to make a living. That's true. Anyway, I say I don't believe in that hocus pocus stuff, but your story reminded me of something that I witnessed when I was about 12 years old. I'm in my early 70s now, and every October when I start seeing the Halloween decorations going up, I can't help but remember, and it really does make me question all the things I think I know. I grew up in, a, I grew up in rural Indiana. We were not farmers, but we lived in farm country. We had a little brick rancher and a lot of about an acre, and our property sat right up against a sizable farm. It was probably 200 acres. I never knew the farmer. He was already old when I was a kid. He was very much a recluse and never socialized with anyone. That's why I found it so odd when every fall, and it had to be during the month of October, I would see him going around his farm, checking his fences, or just messing around in the fields, doing whatever farmers do in their fields in the fall, after their last cut of hay, and half the time there would be another man with him. Honestly, I thought it was his son. This was just an assumption on my part. I thought it was his son because the man appeared to be middle-aged, and like I said, the farmer was already old. Also, the two never seemed to speak to each other. The younger man just followed the old farmer around as if he were shadowing him, learning about farming or something. I mentioned the guy to my parents once during dinner and they said they'd never noticed him. They also told me that the farmer didn't have any kids. He'd never been married. He was a peculiar bachelor, is how my parents put it. It would take me until I was in high school to understand that that many was gay. Anyway, I was in high school when the farmer died. Since he had no children, the farm went to one of his nephews and today the old farm is a sprawling subdivision full of yuppies and BMWs. Yeah, we've seen that around here in Virginia a lot too. <clears throat> My family went to the farmer's funeral, even though we'd never had a relationship with the man because, well, that's what people did back in those days. They went to funerals of neighbors to show their respects. I guess looking back on it now, with all the problems people in the world have today with neighbors and whatnot, I can see how having nothing to do with your neighbors was probably the greatest way to show them respect while they were living. Hmm, agreed. 
Anyway, while at the funeral, I was walking around looking at pictures of the man. They were of various stages of his life. In one picture, I saw the man I'd been seeing for several Octobers. I asked who it was, and my parents said it was his father. In the picture, the farmer himself was about 20. My parents told me that his father had died of a heart attack when he was only 46 years old. I didn't tell my parents that the man in the picture, the farmer's father, was the man I'd been seeing in the fields. I knew they'd think I was crazy. To this day, I am convinced I must have been confused because, again, I do not believe in this hocus-pocus stuff that you and others like you push on social media for the sake of making an easy buck or two. It ain't that easy, brah. You know how long it takes to get enough followers and subscribers to get paid? Brah. <clears throat> Please do not take this as an insult. Well, no, of course not. I do not mean it to be, and I understand why you do it. A real man will lower his standards and stoop beneath his perceived level of dignity to do what is necessary to provide for the welfare of his family. And it is one of the reasons I respect you so much and continue to check in on your channel every so often. I know you are capable of much more higher quality content, but I also know we live in an age where such content is underappreciated and you've got bills to pay the same as the rest of us. Spot on. I'm not convinced I was seeing the ghost of the farmer's father all those years ago, but I am convinced that there might be something to this hocus pocus stuff, but I refuse to believe it probably because like most people, I'm simply scared of that which I don't fully understand and cannot explain through rational means. Anyway, I hope this helps. You have my permission to share this story and my name in one of your videos or in print should you decide to use it in one of your upcoming short story collections. I don't really do Christmas because the whole Jesus thing doesn't make much sense to me either, but I am fond of your little Christmas countdown block sets you make in your workshop. Should my name be drawn in the raffle you do, I'd like one of those. Best wishes, David Aurelis. Yeah, that's right. Last December, I was, uh, for people who would submit these short stories, I'd pull a name randomly and send them something I make in my... Well, I'll be dagged on if I didn't just hear a tree knock back there in the woods behind me. <clears throat> Tell you, him, her, it, or they sure do love creepy story time, don't they? Well, that was a really good story. Um, hope you liked it. Let's move on to another one. Cool, this one's really creepy. Uh, let's see, it's not, it's not so long either. Oh yeah, this one's even shorter. It's just right here and then like the next page. So bear with me. See, that's all the longer it is. Okay. The man, <clears throat> excuse me, the pollen gets to me this time of year. The man at the window that wasn't there. Submitted by Stephen Bain. Stephen Bain, thank you for your story. Hi, Crazy Lake. I love your YouTube channel, Homesteading Off The Grid, the most successful homesteading channel that has nothing to do with homesteading, as you call it. Great name. Anyone who can't see the genius behind what you've done is a simpleton. <laughs> I know, right? Anyway, quick story. When I was a kid, we lived in an old house, much like the one you and your family live in. It was certainly more than 100 years old at the time. I was in kindergarten when we bought it, and I remember while being shown around the house by the realtor, we were in the master bedroom, which was downstairs. As we were all leaving the room, out of the corner of my eye, I saw a man staring at me through the window. But here's the deal. There was no window there. It was a wall. And on the other side of the wall was the kitchen. I wrote it off to seeing things that weren't there. I mentioned it to my mother, and I guess she remembered it, because about a year later, she said she had the same experience. As she was leaving the master bedroom one morning, she thought she caught a glimpse of a man staring at her through a window that wasn't there. A window in the middle of the wall, the wall that separated the bedroom from the kitchen. She said it was the bright sunlight shining through the window coming from behind the man that had caught her attention and made her look. However, when she turned her head to look at the wall directly, of course, it was just a wall. My mother shared this story with my father that evening at dinner, and he said he had some sort of recurring dream that he was being awakened in the mornings by the sun shining through a window, a window in that wall. When he wakes up and sits up, of course, he's reminded that there is no window there, just a wall on the other side of which was the kitchen. Fast forward, and fast forward until I'm in high school. My parents decided to do an addition on the house to make the kitchen and dining room 
areas bigger. The construction crew comes in to tear the old kitchen and dining room off the side of the house to make the extension, and what they found was a double wall. The house had been built in the late 1800s, and originally the wall in the master bedroom that separated it from the kitchen was not added until the 1920s. It had, it had been the original wall of the house. When they tore the kitchen off, they found that in between the walls of the kitchen and the master bedroom, there was the original wall. And get this, it had a window in it. The glass was still intact. We have no idea of explaining this, and we have no idea who the man might have been that my mother and I saw. But we're all in agreement that houses can be haunted simply by their own spirits. Keep up the great work on your channel. I enjoy every episode. Sincerely, Stephen Bain. Wow, isn't that creepy? I'd be curious if there were like any fingerprints or you know, nose prints on that window from where the, 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 the man that wasn't there was looking through the window that wasn't there. Of course, that would obviously mean that the fingerprints and nose prints weren't there. Duh, just answered my own question. It looks like it's gonna rain. I might ought to speed this up a little bit. Kind of hard to do with my Southern accent. I'll try my best. All right, last story. Let's go to answer some of the questions you guys had. I'll just touch on it briefly. This one's not so long. Well, it's a little longer than the other two. Um, but hey, man, feels good to be telling along with lately. Been making all these one minute long jokes on multiple, multiple, multiple social media platforms. This one is called The Haunted Twin. <clears throat> and this one uh, was submitted anonymously. Okay. Hi, Kevin. I want to tell you about something that's happened to me off and on throughout life. I'm 65 years old and it's only happened three times and the incidents were years apart, but it's something that I think you'll agree is quite memorable by the time I'm finished telling my tale. The wind's picking up. I give you my permission to use this story any way you'd like. You can read it on your YouTube channel, which I love by the way, or you can use it in any of your short story collections, which I also love. I've read all of your novels too. You have an amazing gift when it comes to writing, and I think all of the people who only watch you on YouTube and don't read your books are really missing out. Yeah, you're goofy in many of your videos, but when it comes to the written word, you young man are brilliant. Thank you for calling me young. I do, however, ask that you keep me anonymous. This is the type of story that if the wrong people were to catch wind of, could get someone unwillingly medicated or worse, locked up. I've heard you talk about impasse before and that's a topic I've always been interested in. Strange things happen up at this campground when I tell these tales. All right. Uh, not because I think I'm an empath, but because I think I've met some throughout my lifetime. Either empaths or mediums or something. All I know is there are people out there who seem to have abilities that most folks don't. I think it's a shame that most folks write it off to hogwash because they can't understand it, but I do not. So here goes. The first time it happened, I was only eight years old. A group of friends and I were swimming in the river. There was a really nice swimming hole, deep and calm. But halfway out into the river, the water got pretty rapid. We used to go out into the rapid part and float on our backs and let the current wash us back into the calm part. It was fun. One time, I went out too far. The current started carrying me off down the river. I was a good swimmer, but an eight-year-old little girl only has so much stamina. Before I knew it, I was exhausted from keeping my head up above water. I started going under and I just started reaching up with my hands trying to grab tree limbs that were hanging over the river or boulders or anything. Finally, I felt a hand. I grabbed it and whoever the person the hand belonged to uh, pulled me out and I was immediately coughing up water, but I'd made it safely onto the bank. My friends came running down to check on me. When they got there, they asked, who was that that pulled you out? You see, when I finally caught my breath, I looked up to see who it was as well, but there was no one. No one there. I told my friends I didn't know. They said she looked just like you, but her hair was longer. Later, when I was in my late 20s, I was involved in a car crash. It was stupid on my part. I'd been out with some of my friends and we'd been drinking. We should not have driven, but we decided that my friend Laura would drive because she'd had less to drink than the rest of us. 
We didn't make it a mile down the road. We'd been drinking up an old country back road, ironically not far from the river where I'd almost drowned when I was eight. Laura went off the road and then overcorrected to get back on and she actually flipped the car over the hill. It would have landed on top of us, but it got caught by a tree. Hold that thought. I've got a sleeping bag out over here. I'm gonna put it in the tent and we're probably gonna finish the story from the tent. So how's this for a new setup? This is really neat. I'm sitting just inside the tent under the awning so I can stay dry and the book stays dry, the camera stays dry. I got my sleeping bag in here out of the, so it didn't get wet. But now you have the view as if you're in the tent camping with me as I read you these creepy campfire side tales, even though there's still no fire in the fire pit. And uh, you get a view of our vast estate down there, you know. Once upon a time, you could see the house from here, but our meadow is reforesting and the trees are getting so tall. It's blocking the view now. Um, it's really become an, it's become a beautiful place. It was already beautiful. It's getting even more beautiful. So anyway, back to our story. And ironically, now that I'm set up in here, the rain looks like it's stopping. But this is still a nice view. Uh, so they were in the car, drinking and driving like they should not have been. And the car flipped over the hill, but a tree caught the car. Okay. Laura and our other friend. Yep, this is right. Laura and our other friend who'd we'd been who'd been with us were able to crawl out of the car. But I was in the back seat and the tree that had caught us and ironically saved our lives had me blocked in. All of a sudden I saw the other door open and a hand reach in. I grabbed it, assuming it was Laura or our other friend, and I allowed them to pull me up and out of the car. When I jumped down off the car, I saw that Laura and our other friend were already up in the road. Laura said, who the hell was that? Our other friend and I said, who? And Laura said, that woman that pulled you out. I said, I thought it was one of you guys. They both said they'd never left the road since crawling back into it. Again, I was told by Laura that whoever it was that pulled me out of the car looked just like me. The third and final time so far that it happened was last month at my mother's funeral. My mother lived to be 88, but she finally passed. I was the last person to visit her open casket before it was closed and taken to the cemetery for burial. At the reception after the funeral, one of my mother's friends approached me and asked who the woman was that was standing with me as I looked at my mother. I told her I was alone, and she said, and I quote, you weren't alone. It looked like you were standing beside your twin sister. Kevin, that's the thing. I had a twin, but she was stillborn eight minutes before I was born prematurely. I wasn't expected to make it, but I did. And on top of all this, I never tell anyone about my stillborn twin. Actually, it was something I'd forgotten all about until after the car crash incident. When that happened, I thought back to my near drowning incident. Now, all these years later, after the funeral incident, I'm convinced my twin has been with me my whole life. It's just that I couldn't see her and very few other people have been able to. Keep up the great work on your channel, Kevin. I hope you don't stop making videos. I know you said recently you were going to focus on other endeavors as YouTube is suppressing your views because you won't e-beg for them. I'm not surprised because I know how big companies are, but I hope you understand there is a need for people who do what you do. You provide an outlet for people like me who wouldn't have a place to tell their strange experiences otherwise. Sincerely, Anonymous. All right, so she touched on why I just don't really do a lot of videos anymore. Many of you it, it, remember I used to make videos every day. I have always loved it. I've always enjoyed it. Uh, my wife and I started this family, used to have my son in some videos. After we were stalked a few times, we kind of backed away from the family stuff. And then, of course, after I was stalked a few more times by a different crowd, the Bigfoot Sasquatch people started backing away from that. Um, we went from zero followers zero subscribers to finally meeting the it took us six months to get a thousand subscribers and enough watch time to become monetized shortly after that we went viral for the first time um and then we just took off running and never looked back uh, several really good years went by uh and um i was contacted last summer by the folks at this platform and given a personal coach rep is whatever they call themselves and who was flattering me telling me how they can't believe my channel has grown so organically with no help from them. And so they were here to help me now. I was like, oh, 
great. What do we do? Well, then pretty much like the writer suggested in the story there, they insinuated heavily that I began e-bagging uh, by way of super chats, you know, making sure to always point out, you can send a super chat for this. You get this little icon by your name. I have always enjoyed, the thing I've enjoyed most about social media is that if you can figure it out, and it's an industry, uh, and like any other industry, there's a system. I've been doing this for 13, 14 years. I was fortunate enough to figure it out several years ago. Most folks will see um, successful content creators, and they say, oh, they just got lucky. Oh, they just they knew the right people. Well, this is what people say about everybody who's successful, right? They just got lucky. That's what unsuccessful people say about successful people. The fact of the matter is, people who are successful are successful, whereas people who are not successful aren't, because successful people are willing to do the things, namely the work, that unsuccessful people are not willing to do. Um, you can make your first 500 videos for YouTube and you won't make a dime. You will not get monetized. Mr. B said this recently. Uh, that was our experience. We literally had between five and 600 videos before we even got monetized. Well, if you make 40 or 50 videos and say, well, this isn't my thing or I'm not lucky like that other guy or that other girl, and then you stop, of course it's not going to work out for you. Well, so I was, uh, I was encouraged to e-bag and I just, I didn't want to do it. I mean, the super chats were available and all that. And I mentioned it a couple of times. Um, it's just, I love that you can come here and be entertained for free and it doesn't cost you a dime. You don't have to donate. I appreciate it when you buy my books from Amazon or Etsy, you better believe it. Um, but every October when I have it, I, I read you October nights. I don't even charge for that. So you are entertained and I am paid ludicrously by you know the advertisers on the the platform i don't need to beg and you don't need to be giving me your money because you got your own bills to pay right well i didn't do it and so they stopped featuring my content i'd become so popular and was getting so many views um the algorithms were featuring my content well it stopped i i just wouldn't e-bag and it stopped and i made a video about that i think it was november or december of last year and I said, if I stop making videos and you don't see me here I, and I disappear, it's because I'm pursuing other endeavors and you wait. You give me 90 days, you'll see me viral on other platforms. Many of you watching in the last couple of months have seen me viral on TikTok, on Instagram, on Facebook, uh, where we're getting you know, on Facebook alone, just shy of 20 million views a month now. Listen, they say every man has his price. I don't. You want to stop featuring me and kick my bank account and make my revenues drop because I won't beg for you. You're not the only game in town, brah. We've hooked up with some others and we make multiple times the revenues than our best times ever were on this platform. So that's what happened. That's where it went. Uh, I have watched people go through similar things and then blame the platform, blame uh, you know, I'm not successful here anymore because this entity came along and did this and it put me out of business. No, you're not successful anymore because you gave up. You quit. You had a challenge that you were not willing to overcome. Well, we've done that. Um, I'm sure many of you have gone from here to follow us on Facebook at Sick Twisted Humor, where we already have 611,000 followers, 20 million views a month. And I want to thank you for that. So that kind of explains my absence. I am trying to get back over here now that I can, because I had to do that because this vast estate, it ain't paid off yet, brah. I got a mortgage, okay? So I had to take care of my family and me first. That's been done, and I want to thank those of you who have helped me do it. And I'm going to do my best to get back over here and keep telling you these creepy campfire stories, especially since my wife done took off and left me last night and ran into the house when I started telling one to her. See you for more next time on the most popular homesteading channel on the internet that has nothing to do with homesteading. Homesteading off the grid.